Hey, welcome all to the course of Software Defined Networking. In today's lecture, I am going to uh, to talk about security in software defined networks. The objective for this lecture is that at the end of this lecture, you would be able to revise some basic concepts of network security like cryptography, symmetric and asymmetric encryption, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, etc. You would also be able to present an overview of the STN security requirements and describe security advantages of STN. Besides, you would be able to understand security issues specifically related to the STN and also the attacks that can be performed against different layer, layers of the STN. And finally, you would be able to propose different security related solutions to the problem to the challenges in STN. Here is a brief uh, roadmap for this lecture. We are going to start with some basic security concepts that would help us to understand the contents of this lecture and then some security objective goals are requirement and then we will turn our attention to the advantages and issues related to security in STN. And finally, some attacks on different layers of the STN. Some basic concepts. Let us review them. Cryptography is actually the backbone of network security. And the word cryptography itself is derived from Greek word words cryptos and grapho. Cryptos means hidden while grapho means writing. It comes to the conclusion that the art of secret writing is known as cryptography. You can also say it is the science of using mathematics to encrypt and decrypt data. It also enables us to store sensitive information and also to transmit sensitive information over an insecure network, for example, the Internet. The primary goal of cryptography is to hide the meaning of the messages, not actually the existence of such messages. If you want to hide the existence of such messages, then that field is known as watermarking or stenography. Some basic terminologies related to the cryptography are mentioned in this figure. The first thing that we need to know is the plain text. The original message that we want to transmit is known as the plain text, which is also sometimes referred as the clear text. This is the text, this is the message that can be read and understood without any special measures. On the other side, we have the ciphertext, which is the coded message, that is the encrypted message. When we encrypt the plain text, then the resultant version of that text is known as the ciphertext. And this ciphertext is in unreadable form. To convert the plain text into ciphertext, we need an algorithm. And that algorithm is known as cipher. That is actually the algorithm that we use to transform the plain text into ciphertext. And this process is actually known as encryption or sometime it is also known as encrypt or encode or encipherment. And this is actually the conversion of the plain text into ciphertext by using a key. Here the sender is Alice. So her key is represented by KA. On the other side, we have a process that is known as decryption. And for that, we need a decryption algorithm. Decryption is also known as decipherment or decoding. This is actually the process which is opposite of encryption. And this is the process of converting the cipher text back into plain text or deriving the plain text from this cipher text. Recovering the plain text from the cipher text is known as decryption. And then we have a terminology that is known as script analysis, which is also called code breaking. 
and it is the science of analyzing and breaking this secure communication without knowing the key. Bob can derive the plain text from the ciphertext by using the key. And the key here is represented by KB. B stands for Bob. However, sometime an attacker, for example, Trudy, he would be able to analyze and break this secure communication without knowing these keys. So the study of principles and methods for transforming this cipher text back into plain text without knowing the keys or without having the knowledge of the keys is known as script analysis. And finally, we have cryptology, which is actually the science of the study. Uh, is, is the science in which we study about cryptology and crypt analysis. Our next concept is symmetric encryption, which is also known as conventional or private key or secret key or single key encryption. It was the only type of encryption that was available for use prior to the development of public key encryption that we will study in the next uh, on the next slide. Actually, the symmetric key encryption uh, is a very simple type of encryption in which we use a shared key both for encryption as well as for decryption. We use the same key. We use a single key both for encryption and decryption. In this encryption method, the sender and receiver, they require to share the common key. This shared key must be known only to the sender and the receiver. That is the only secret. If either copy of the key falls into the wrong hands, then the message can be decrypted by the intruders. So the primary challenge in this symmetric encryption is getting the key to the receiver or delivering the key to the receiver, a process that must be conducted out of band to avoid interception. In other words, the process must use a channel or band other than one which is carrying the ciphertext. On the other side, uh, in the asymmetric encryption, which is another type of cryptography, another technique, here we have to use a pair of keys. One key is used for encryption while the second key is used for decryption. And this is an alternative method to the symmetric encryption. This is also known as public key encryption. Instead of using a single key, which is shared by the two participants, a public key cipher actually uses a pair of keys. But remember, these keys are interrelated with one another. And one key is used any key, either the private key or the public key that can be used for encryption, while the other key can be used for decryption. And this pair of keys must be owned by each participant. The sender must need a pair of keys while the receiver also I need a pair of keys. The owner keeps the private key, which is also known as the decryption key, secret, so that only the owner can decrypt the message. And this key is known as the private key. The decryption key is also known as the private key, which must be kept secret, while the public key on the other side must be shared with the recipient or with the whole world. Okay. Because that is the key that is used for encryption, while the private key is used for decryption purposes. So you can say that uh, symmetric encryption uh, on the previous slide <coughs> uses a single key, both for encryption and for decryption, while asymmetric encryption uses two different keys, but these keys are related with one another. Here in this figure, it can be seen that the public key has been used for encryption and the private key has been used for decryption but you can use any key for encryption as well as for decryption. However, it is recommended to use the public key. While for digital signature, which is another concept, we normally use the private key for, for creating the signature and public key for verification of the signature. Now let's come towards the <coughs> security requirements, which are also known as security objectives or security services, security goals, security tried or CIA. The security of any information system has three main components, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and they are known as CIA.
First, let us see what is confidentiality. Actually, it is the most important aspect of security. It is concerned with having the secret data remains secret. It actually ensures that only users with the rights, with the privileges, they would be able to access this information. When unauthorized individual or unauthorized system view the confidential information, then we can say that the confidentiality has been compromised or the confidentiality has been breached. Confidentiality not only applies to the storage of information, you can also apply it to the data which is in transmission. We need our data to be remain confidential while we want to transfer it from one location to another location. Whenever we want to send a piece of information uh, to be stored in a remote computer or when we retrieve a piece of information from a remote computer, we need to conceal the information during its transmission. We want to tight the confidentiality of the information during its transmission. Actually, the confidentiality has two concepts. One is related with the data confidentiality and another one is related with the privacy. And data confidentiality actually ensures that the private or the confidential information is not made available or it has been not disclosed to the unauthorized individual. On the other side, privacy actually ensures that the individual's control or influence what information related to them may be collected and stored and by whom that information uh, would be used, etc. So that is like uh, about legislation, uh, legislation or about the policies that we actually need to ensure to our customers that what we are doing with their data. On the other side, integrity is something that is related with the accuracy of the information. And it means that unauthorized users should not be able to modify the data without the owner's permission. In computer networks, in data communication, integrity means ensuring the receiver or make sure or give surety to the receiver that the received data has not been altered, changed in any way, in any form from the origin, from where it has been transmitted. And the integrity of information is threatened when it is exposed to any damage, destruction, disruption or any change. And there are plenty of malwares that can actually uh, attack on the data or change the data. For example, different viruses, different types of malwares like worms, viruses, Trojan horses, etc. They are responsible for making changes. Even different types of attacks, even different types of attackers, they can change the integrity of the data. For integrity purposes, to achieve integrity, we can use different techniques, but we will not go into the details. And the techniques are like file hashing, or sometimes we use the technique of checksum for error checking, etc. Then we have the availability. And availability is the third component of the information security. The principle of availability states that information should be available to the authorized user all the time. And it is an important aspect of reliability. It assumes or maybe uh, it try to assure that a system authorized user have timely and uninterruptible access to the information. So it can assure that system work promptly and services is not delayed, not denied to the authorized user. And there is a type of attack which we are going to study in this lecture, which is known as denial of service attack. It is becoming increasingly common and it is actually an attack on the availability of the data or on the availability of the system. These are the three basic principles. However, later on people decided that these, these three fundamental properties are not enough for all possible scenarios. And they added additional ones like non-repudiation, which actually means that the rejection of the data means one party, anyone, sender or receiver, cannot deny 
either the sending of a message or receiving of a message. If you have sent the message, then later on you cannot deny that you did not send that message. If you have received a message, then later on you cannot deny that you did not receive that message. And there are ways available for achieving non-repudiation. Similarly, we have authentication. And this is a very common concept that we all know and we all use it. Uh, and this is actually the property of being genuine and being able to be verified and being able to be trusted. This means that verifying that <coughs> user who they say they are. Or actually they are. It is a state of being genuine or original rather than a reproduction or fab fabrication. And information is authentic when it is in the same state in which it was created, placed, stored or even transmitted. And then we have the accountability. Systems must need to keep records of their activities for forensic analysis or you can say to track security breaches means that it should be possible to track actions of an entity uniquely to that entity. What you have performed on the data, a log file must be created in which the transaction that you have performed at the time on which the transaction was performed, the IP address from which the transaction was performed, the location from which the transaction was performed, the user ID who performed the transaction and information like that for accountability purposes. That is important. Now let's, uh, after studying this concept, let's uh, shed some light on the security advantages of SDN. This lecture is about the security problems, challenges of the SDN. But before going into the details, uh, it is important to understand that SDN can also, is also beneficial for the security. Its architecture provides us a secure environment up to some extent. Compared to the traditional network architectures, security threats to SDN, they are more uh, concentrated they are more on the rise because of the design nature of the SDN. However, still there are some advantages and only two advantages I have mentioned them over here. The first advantage is effective monitoring of the abnormal traffic. And this is due to the fact that SDN controller, we know from this course that SDN, con con SDS SDN controller provide an abstract level view of the whole network. So you can, or the SDN controller can see the entire network and it can see the entire network traffic simultaneously. So it is easier to notice ab uh, abnormal behavior in the network traffic that is caused by an attacker. And second advantage of this architecture is timely dealing with vulnerabilities. This is another important advantage that can be attributed to the nature of the programmable network environment. Once a new thread has been detected, operators can program new software to analyze and deal with the vulnerability immediately without spending time to wait for an update of the operating system or application software integrated in the manufacturer proprietary devices. And in addition to that, the SDN controller can achieve a security policy configuration which is going to cover from layer 2 up to layer 7 of the OSI architecture. And it can even provide more granular security control. But our focus is on the challenges. So let us see. Security issues in SDN. Here we are going to, to study some issues that are related to security in the software defined network. The first one is vulnerable controller. Most functions like uh, network information collection, network configuration, routing calculation, etc. They are concentrated. They are uh, attached, they are related 
with the SDN controller. He's like the boss who is actually managing all these stuff. The architecture of SDN provides a more concentrated target for and greatly reduce the difficulty of such attacks. We just have two advantages. This that the architecture of the SDN actually provide a more concentrated target for or greatly reduces the difficulty of such attack. But at the same time, the development of cloud computing provides the attacker with very large scale computing abilities. You have resources available on paper use basis in the cloud computing environment. So with the support of cloud computing platform, attackers can easily implement attacks. If the attacker successfully sees the controller of the SDN, which is like the boss, the brain of the SDN, then they can cause massive destructions in the network services. And they can even affect the whole network that is covered by this controller. So there is a serious issue and that is related with the controller. The second issue is related with the risks that are caused by the open programmable interfaces. We know in the SDN architecture there are three layers and we have plenty of different APIs available, different interfaces available and due to their open nature SDN is more susceptible to security threats. Oops. First, it makes the software vulnerable or you can say it makes uh, the software vulnerabilities of the SDN controller fully exposed to a taker. If the interface is open, that interface leads you to the SDN controller, then it makes the software vulnerability of the SDN controller fully exposed to the attacker. As later we will see it in details. Second reason is that SDN controller actually provides a large number of programmable interfaces like the open flow interface, like the northbound, southbound interfaces. So normally the northbound interfaces which actually connect the SDN to the application layer and this uh, this interface is actually it actually provide a level of openness and this openness may lead to an abuse of the interface for example an attacker can use this open interface for embedding malicious code malicious software like viruses etc so the open interfaces of SDN controller need to be carefully evaluated and examined the third issue is related with different points of attacks. Actually, we can uh, define SDN into three layers. And the entities of each layer may be spread across different locations of the network. And communication between uh, these entities will be necessarily <coughs> and more frequently. So compared to the traditional network, SDN actually provide more possible attack points for the attacker. And here it has been shown like there are different points of attacks in the SDN. In this diagram, only six points are mentioned, but there could be more attacks possible on the SDN. So here, the first type of attack is the SD is a take on the SDN switch. Here we have a switch and the attacker try to target the SDN switch. An SDN switch is generally a separate device which is composed of a related hardware and software and which is vulnerable to an attack. An example of such attack could be like the size limitation of the flow table. The second type of attack which is mentioned here is on the communication between the switches or it is an attack against the links between the SDN switches. Almost data packets uh, transmitted between SDN switches they are not encrypted and many contains many of these packets that are transmitted between these switches they will contain sensitive information in an encrypted form. These packets can be intercepted by an attacker very easily, especially when the links between the switches are wireless, which are more prone to the attackers, more open to the attackers. Third attack 
is on the controller, the SDN controller. As stated previously, the controller is the most attractive target for the attackers. And due to the openness of programmability and complexity of its functionality, the controller software is uh, vulnerable and this can be exploited for malicious attacks. And then on the fourth number, we have an attack on the links between the controller and the switch. All forwarding rules are actually inserted into these switches by this controller. The data packets that contain these rules can be tampered by this attacker through eavesdropping on the link between the controller and the switch, which will result in uh, in the insertion of a malicious code or maybe some type of modification in the message and things like that. And then we have an attack on the communication links between controllers. In a multi-controller environment, the communication between different controllers is necessary for retaining the consistent state of the whole network. Remember, more than one controller are possible in an SDN. And this controller needs to communicate with one another for coordination and cooperation purposes. So the data packets in the links between the controllers can be intercepted by an attacker. And this could provide possible clues to the attacker for compromising the controllers. And finally, we have an attack over the application software. And the application software is built on the controller directly and is generally located on the same physical device on which the controller rely or on which the controller exists. When the application software invokes the function of the controllers through the northbound APIs, malicious code may be embedded into the controller by using this application software. Hence, the application software is considered the most convenient attack point for seizing the controller. You can get control of the controller by using the vulnerabilities in the application software. Now let's see some security attacks on the SDN. SDN actually represents a significant departure from the traditional architecture, network architecture, and may not mesh well with existing network approaches that we actually use for the traditional network. So SDN involves a three-layer architecture which is shown here, the application, uh, the control, and the data plane. And new techniques for uh, securing this network is the need of the time. So all of this new type of architecture, this brand new design, introduces the potential for new targets of for attacks. And this figure actually illustrates the potential locations of the security threats in the SDN architecture. You can see threats can actually occur at any of the three layers or it can occur on any of the communication channels or on the APIs. So threat can occur at any of the three layers or in the communication channels between the, the different layers. As you can see here, hardware and software plot platforms at any layer are potential target for malicious softwares and attacks performed by the attacker. In addition, the protocols and the APIs related to the SDN, they also provide a new target for different types of security attacks. Now let us see some type of attacks. First, we are going to study attacks on the data plane layer. These are the threats to the data forwarding layer. The data forwarding layer, as we know, is located at the bottom of the SDN architecture. And it consists of hundreds of, or thousands of switches. And those switches are interconnected with one another. And these switches are, are responsible for forwarding packets. Now, Imagine if a switch is compromised, the packet that flows through it will not be forwarded correctly. Who monitors the forwarding rules? The switch. Sorry, who, who do the actual forwarding the switches? So if the switches are compromised, they will not do the right forwarding. In addition, switches are the direct entry point of network access for end users. And attackers can attack a switch by simply attaching a link to a port to this switch. Therefore, it is important to recognize security threats and find countermeasures and solutions for SDN switches. The key area of risk with respect to the data plane is actually uh, the 
the interface, the southbound API, such as OpenFlow or OpenVSwitch, uh, database management protocol, etc. These APIs, they are actually a powerful tool for managing the data plane network elements. But they also increase the attack surface of the network infrastructure because security is no longer limited to the network equipment supplier. So the security of the, of the network could be compromised by unsecure implementation of the southbound API. And this could actually enable a taker to add their own flows into the flow table. Remember the concept of the flow table that we have studied in this course, which actually contain different type of flows information. So the attacker can add their own flows into the flow table and then uh, spoof the traffic that would otherwise be disallowed on the network. For example, the attacker might be able to define flows that will bypass a firewall to introduce unwanted traffic or provide a mean of eavesdropping attack. More generally, compromising the southbound API would allow attackers to directly control the network elements as a whole. To further understand this type of attack, we need to understand the concept of open flow switch, at least the components of the open flow switch. An open flow switch, as you an abstract level switch you can see here, is actually contains from or is com uh, contains three functions modules. And they are the open flow client, the flow table, and the flow buffer. And these three components are mentioned here. When the switch receives a packet from an input port, these are the input ports. When it receives a packet, it will place this packet in this flow at the at the uh, at the tail of this flow, like first in first out. So the last packet. So when it places this packet in the flow buffer, it will then search this flow table and will try to find a rule that matches the message fields of this packet that it received. If an appropriate rule is found in this table, the packet will be removed from this flow and will be forwarded to an output port. Otherwise, if it does not found any rule in this table, the switch will send a special packet that is known as packet in message through the open flow client. Okay, so this open through this open flow uh, flow client, it will send a message, and that message is packet in message through the client to the controller, and it will request for instruction. Hey, I found a packet. What to do with that packet? After receiving a new message from this controller, sorry, after receiving a message from this flow table, the controller would make a routing calculation and will insert a new rule into this flow table. Let me repeat. We receive a packet by using input port. We put the packet in the flow buffer and then we consult the flow table to find a rule. If the rule is there, the packet will be forwarded on the output port. If there is no rule found, this will be, uh, the, the controller will be consulted with the help of OpenFlow client, and then the controller will define a new rule by, based on the calculation. And it will insert a new rule into this flow table. Now, according to this, pro this process, we can identify three main security threats. And those threats are man in the middle and distributed uh, denial of service attack on the uh, to to saturate the flow table and deny, denial of service attack to saturate or overflow this flow buffer. The first type of attack, man in the middle attack. A man in the middle attack is actually a classical network intrusion method and the main principle is to insert an agent node between the source and the destination and is used to intercept communication data and tamper with them uh, without being detected by either side of the communication and specific attack method of man in the middle attack 
they include session hijacking spoofing port mirroring and so on but we will not go into the details so a man in the middle attack between the controller and the switch in this case we have a controller we have a switch and an attacker try to perform an attack here that attack is known as the man in the middle attack it is an attack between the controller and the switches and this is ideal choice for attacking the uh, for attacking an SDN is it can be used to intercept and temper with the forwarding rules and those rules are issued by uh, by the controller to the switch in order to gain control of the network packet forwarding if you get access here you would be able to forward packet the way you want then we have denial of service attack against the flow table the reactive uh, rule design of open flow actually make the switch vulnerable to denial of service attack since packets with an unknown destination address will cause a new rule to be inserted uh, in the switch an attacker can generate a large amount of packet destinated to unknown network host in a short time and then he or she would be able to quickly fill up the limited flow table storage capacity okay by sending bogus uh, destinated address packets when the flow table is saturated is filled by irregular traffic then what will happen legal traffic will not be forwarded correctly as there will be no more available capacity for inserting new rules this is the first type of denial of service attack which is against the flow table similarly we do have a denial of service attack against the flow buffer it is another target of this uh, of uh, denial of service attack and before as we just uh, described before forwarding the packets they are buffered in the flow buffer they are waiting for results of the rule search or insertion of a new rule so packet in this uh, flow buffer will be marked for deletion on first in first out basis to release the storage space and let the space available for the incoming packets now as in the case of flow table the storage capacity of the flow buffer is also limited and a taker can flood large amount of packet belongs to different flows then they'd encounter by the switch normally so the switch has to buffer these large packets and this lead to saturation of the flow buffer so this is another attack and in this case when the, the 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 original packet the legitimate packets are arrived are received the flow buffer will have no space left to store these packets and what will happen these new packets will be simply dropped there are some countermeasures to handle such type of attacks but we will not go into the details but just for your information the countermeasures are to use a protocol that is known as TLS and it stands for transport layer security and it is actually evolved from another protocol that is SSL secure socket layer and for this to understand we need to understand the concept of sockets and port numbers and things like that but we will not go into the details Okay, so these are some of the countermeasures, and this is what I uh, explained the concept of the T, uh, the concept of the TLS. So here, uh, this is an architecture which actually show the layer on which the TLS has been deployed. Well. To go fastly through this slide with TLS in place, an application running on top of it has a TLS socket address and communicates to the TLS socket of the remote application. Actually, the TLS provides security functions, but those security functions are actually transparent to the user so nor the tcp nor the uh, the applications they need to be modified to use the security feature of the tls anyway this is a countermeasure to deal with such type of attacks and this actually provide us uh, three types of services 
confidentiality, integrity, and authentication. All data that pass between two applications, for example, two HTTP on two different machines, they are encrypted. So they cannot be eavesdrop. Message integrity. TLS actually ensure that the message is not altered or substituted for in root. And also authentication. TLS can validate the identity of, of one or both the partner to exchange uh, uh, using public key certificate and that is another concept so we will not go into the details next threats are for the control plane in the SDN architecture the control layer there is the open flow controller okay and its security have a direct impact on the data forwarding layer who control the actual forwarding, who define the rules, the controller. So that is important. If a controller is compromised, the whole network, including a potentially large number of switches, they may be affected. This is because if a switch cannot receive forwarding rules from the controller, it will not know how to forward the packet. Hence, due to its important role, the controller may become a key target for the attacker. Attackers would love to perform different types of attack against this controller. Some of the attacks that we mentioned here are denial or distributed denial of service attack on the controller. <coughs> so this attack as we just explained on the previous uh, slide. Here the attacker attempts to make the controller uh, to make the controller function uh, unavailable to the authentic users legitimate users how by sending a large number of packets to consume the memory to consume the computing resources of this controller the attacker would try to send a large number of packets towards this controller An attacker could uh, produce enormous flooding traffic in a short time to an SDN enabled network. And this traffic will be mixed together with the normal traffic as we have the normal traffic as well. And it will be difficult to distinguish between these two types of traffic for the controller. And according to the open flow specification, if a switch uh, does not know how to handle a new packet what will happen as we just saw here it will send a message and that message is known as packet in message to the controller to request for instruction therefore in case of a distributed or a denial of service attack the controller will have to deal with a large amount of packet in messages generated by the flooding traffic in a short time which may lead to an exhaustion of resources for processing the normal traffic and at the same time the bandwidth between the controller and the switches may be fully occupied by the attacking traffic and this will seriously reduce the performance of the whole network as well second type of attack is against distributed multi-controller remember uh, if we have a larger network we need more than one controller and that is known as the multi-controller environment so the solution of a distributed controller or cluster controller that has been proposed in recent year in that type of setup setup each individual controller will have to collaborate and cooperate and communicate with other controllers or maybe with the master controller who actually control the other uh, the other uh, controller and the switches so multiple physical controllers managing the network instead of single one that is the distributed controller or multi-controller environment but this distribution must be transparent to the data forwarding layer which means that the controller need to appear as a single controller for the entire network in such situation an application that spans uh, span a multiple network control domains will need to deal with several security problems such as authentication, authorization and privacy issue. In addition to that, distributed uh, setup 
actually require the collaboration of multiple controllers. So the dynamic switchover behavior of the master controller and the coexistence of the multi-controllers -control in a single network domain can cause a configuration conflict as well. Like it, it become problematic to configure more than one controllers. So misconfiguration can also lead to several security impact. Therefore, in summary, in multi-controller architecture, an inconsistent configuration is a security threat. And finally, threats to applications. Since high layer application can obtain network information only by invoking the API that is provided by the controller, so the letter not only needs to ensure the uninhabited access of legitimate application but also it prevent malicious or incorrect application from causing security threats so applications that are running on the controller will will also introduce serious security threats for the controller itself how different applications have different functional requirements which results in a need to customize a different security policy for each of them for example, load balancing application may need to have access to network packet statistics. And on the other side, intrusion detection applications may need to check the header fields of the packet. Now, you see every packet has a different requirement and such custom security policies for each and every individual application will be based on different requirements of the applications. And such uh, things are not being addressed yet in the literature. So this is also a security threat against the, the controller. And we can take different counters measure to address these threats. Some of them are mentioned here. Access control mechanism and a number of access control mechanisms are available. A number of technologies are available. For example, role-based access, attribute-based access and things like that. Similarly, antiviruses can be used. Firewalls can be installed. Intrusion detection system and intrusion prevention system but again we will not go into the details of countermeasures and then application plane threats now we are talking about the northbound apis and the protocols present there they are also targetable by the attacker a successful attack here could allow the attacker to gain control of the network infrastructure which is at the bottom level so hdn security in this area actually focuses on preventing unauthorized users and application from exploiting the controller in addition the application themselves are vulnerable points if an attacker can gain control of an application and if that application is then authenticated to con to the control plan the amount of damage that can be done is considerable. An author, uh, authorized and authenticated application with a broad range of privileges can exercise considerable control over the configuration and operation of the network. In the application layer, attackers can tamper with the network configuration. If an attacker get control of an application, he or she would be able to tamper the network configuration files. Also, he or she can steal the network information or maybe they can seize the network resources and so on they can also insert different type of malwares like spyware like viruses like trojan horses etc so in this manner they can interfere with the normal operation of the control layer and influence the reliability and availability of the network as well although open flow can deploy security detection algorithms for security applications. These security applications are not mandatory. The variety of applications that are developed by independent organization using, they use different programming languages, they, they use different platforms. So interoperability, inconsistency or security policy conflicts will, will arise. So some of the security threats for the applications layer are mentioned here like the illegal access and security rules and configuration conflict. What does illegal access mean? According to the specification of OpenFlow, applications running on the controller are very flexible 
and extendable and have privileges to access network resources and also control the network behavior. However, most of these applications are deployed by the third party organizations, not by the controller vendor. Therefore, the lack of a standardized security mechanism for SDN applications cause serious security threats. And then we have the security rules and configuration conflict. What does it mean? Well, in order to provide a wide range of network services, the application layer needs to have security applications for accessing the security interfaces of the controller. Along with the complexity of the applications, conflicts may appear between security rules, resulting in a confusion of network services and managing management complexities. So different mechanisms are needed to counter Meyer the application access to the control plane and prevent this authenticated application from, from being hacked. So to counter threats, uh, the authentication process involving communication between application and the controller, the communication need to be secure. And the solution for that is the TLS. I would like to leave this topic, how we can actually handle the application plane attacks for the assignment number three. For detailed description about this assignment, please refer to the instruction provided on the course website. Thank you so much. Take care and goodbye.